Our next interview is with Jeff Weber, who is a, a local um, L.A. area bookseller. And Jeff, I'm going to start off by asking you the same question I ask everybody else to start. Tell us something about your background, family, schools, where you grew up, uh, that kind of thing to start off with. Uh, my background is basically that I'm a son of a library director. My father was director of libraries at Stanford University li in, in Stanford, California. He uh, came from Harvard, and I was born in Cambridge. Good for you. And uh, uh, his, his training was at um, Columbia University. He got his library degree there and uh, got his first job at Harvard, and then he was pulled up into the administration offices by Kai's Metcalf. And Kai's uh, trained him and some other young people and brought him along. And then Stanford hired him in 1961. And we moved the whole family to California at that time. Uh, my orientation for books came out of uh, enjoying my father's library partly. But uh, I think I had kind of an instinct or knack for collecting. I collected things that were worth nothing. I collected <laughs> uh, uh, bottle caps and Mars trading cards, and uh, then I collected stamps and um, comic books, and uh, eventually became scientific, I'm sorry, uh, uh, science fiction paperbacks. and <laughs> Amazing uh, stories. Yeah, oh, I loved those. Uh, if uh, Those were too valuable, but the, the dealer I used to uh, do my, I used to sell newspapers and when I would get my my, uh, my my pay, I'd go down and spend it down at the, at the uh, stamp collector shop, <laughs> get my bike down there. And, and uh, <coughs> he had some of those early things, but those, those were things that I didn't buy, uh, the amazing stories things. But uh, eventually, I, I started to work in the Stanford libraries as a student, moving books. And uh, then a job came available at William P. Reedon's bookshop in Palo Alto. And Bill Reedon had, uh, had a well-established business in the AVAA. He had a shop in San Francisco and, uh, and in Burlingame. And, and w I only knew him when he was in Palo Alto. Yeah. And uh, they, they got me started uh, checking like books in print to see if something was still in print and what the price was. And it was sort of getting bill some basis for judging the value of a book. And then they'd have me quoting out books from uh, things they recently acquired. Bo Reedon would give me a selection of books to describe, send out a quotation. They used the photocopy machine all the time. Yeah. And um, I remember that vividly. Yeah. And so I did that for about a half a year, I think. And, and then I went to library school. Um, so, so by the time I was in uh, oh, I'm getting it all turned around, I think. I actually went from, from there to UCLA as for my undergraduate degree. And uh, then after UCLA getting a degree in history, it was then that I returned to Readings again to work for another half year. Be, um, getting, I should have, I, I don't, I didn't expect to have this with dates or anything. Well, but I've, I've well, approximately my, my memory is that, that I, uh, no, I went to library school and then came back, and that would, uh, that would have been in the end of 1978. Uh, and I would have graduated in, in the summer of 78 and then worked for Bill Reedon for a few months, and then I was hired at Zaitlin and Verberge in November 78. That's, that sounds right. Yeah. And um, uh, the very, uh, a very weird story is the very day I left uh, Readins. They had a, another employee there, and he had, he took his own life that uh, that that wow. very day. Not in the shop, <coughs> but in his own home. He was distraught over losing a girl that he was just totally in love with. Carl Zamboni was at at Readins at that time, yeah, and Heiza Huntington was working in the cataloging department. And Heiza and and Zamboni started their business later yeah. together. Uh, I don't see Heiza anymore. Of course, Carl's passed away. But yeah. Carl was famous for being a walking encyclopedia yeah. in, a, in a chimney with his, I with his Turkish cigars. Uh, he's an incredible guy. And if, if you'd ever been in the Reedens' basement, it was, have you been there? 
It oh, was, I used to go into Regan's basement about three times a year. It was extraordinary. I mean, it, there yeah, was there's always nothing like it around. There was always pockets of stuff all over the place. I, don't, I never knew where it all came from. It just always was different. When I arrived there one time, they had the F William Fitzhugh collection mm -hmm. there, and it was fantastic. And it got, I, I was never really knew the whole story, but I believe that it was held up in court because Fitzhugh consigned the books. He died. The son or somebody wanted access to the books. And so Bill ended up holding all these books for years. Mm -hmm. And I could look through them, and they had the most beautiful monuments in English literature yeah. there. They're delicious books. And they also had the Lloyd Sibberell collection, which isn't as famous, but he had a book plate. I knew I would recognize the book plate if I saw it around. Just beautiful books, um, nice condition. Uh, but not anywhere near as, as fabulous as the Fitzhugh book. So it was just delicious to go in there and see what would really have belonged in the library special collections department, not the bottom mm -hmm. of Re Reedon's mm -hmm. basement mm -hmm. with all the spiders and <laughs> the cobweb. Oh, it's uh, it was very dark down there, and he had just <laughs> a, a we used like to bring a flashlights. It was like a, a, a <coughs> reference library in a catacombs. That's what it was like. How long did you uh, stay with Bill before you went into business on your own? Well, for Bill, I had these two sessions where I worked about a few months each, each. total maybe of a year. And then I'd gotten my library to school degree at Indiana University, worked at the Lilly Library as a student just doing um, cataloging of, uh, of uh, Lincoln material. Um, uh, and then, then I got my job at Zaitlin for Brugge and I worked with Jake for 10 years as it turned out. You were out. 10 years with Z Jake? T uh, Jake uh, was a, uh, well, my father had recommended that Jake was a good place to work. Uh, he was well known even to my father, and uh, as it, when I came out of library school, it was 78, and the job market was not as, <laughs> as, as, as fruitful as it may have, uh, as maybe I wanted it to be. Yeah. Uh, I, I had, uh, uh, I hadn't really any pre preconceived notions of what I wanted to do exactly, other than I probably preferred acquisitions over reference work. And, and I remember being given an opportunity to take a job interview at uh, like San Diego State to catalog serials, and I just didn't feel like that's what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really want to work the reference desk and you know the kinds of things that were available to a student getting out of library school maybe didn't seem quite as interesting to me and having already worked in a bookshop and um, it was at that time I thought well I'll talk to Florian Chasky at Stanford and see what he thought and uh, I knew that if I made a decision to go one way or the other that it, it, it would change my career and I had for many years even as a freshman in co at UCLA, th thinking I was going to go on and try to become a librarian, um, so with with uh, with Florian's uh, support, my father's support, I tried the Zaitlin position out, and uh, uh, Jake had um, Bennett Gilbert there at the yeah, time. Yeah. Um, Bennett was was brilliant and and uh, pretty pretty uh, short-tempered, uh, kind of wild in a way, but uh, he, he, he clearly knew a lot about books. And, uh, but he was very, he and I were, were not close in any way yeah. which, uh, whatsoever. I mean, it was, uh, it, I, don't, I don't think many people would say they were close to Bennett in any particular no. way, but, but we had this shop full of dysfunctional people. <laughs> and, and, um, some 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 were more open and 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 uh, uh, easy to get along with than some others. Uh, they, we had um, uh, Bennett quit actually a little while later. It wasn't wasn't long. Be I, th I don't even think he was there a year before. No. Was Michael Thompson there at the time you were there? Oh no no yeah. Michael had left uh, before a you long left. time earlier. So I mean more than a decade earlier, I so think, yeah, and, and Bill Reedon was, I'm sorry, Bill Daly was much earlier as well, yeah. and Jonathan Hill was actually closer, and then Gary Steigerwald was really yeah. the one I, I had replaced. You, oh, you replaced Gary? Basically, yeah. Yeah, I don't think there was much time that between his leaving hmm. and my coming, uh, maybe a few months. Uh, and and 
I didn't know any of those guys beforehand. I think I had met Gary, um, and uh, they had me working in the front of the barn where the art books were, so my workstation, and I uh, got to, to I, w I don't know why, but eventually I learned he, Jake would allow us to do some buying. I mean, <laughs> if that were my shop, it wouldn't be the case. Yeah. Uh, but uh, the, the, uh, the two bookmen and the print department were allowed to make buys somehow, and mm. I was often sent out to look at collections, and uh, sometimes I would make some crazy purchases, just <laughs> bring in, you know, 2,000 books to get one plum. Right. And uh, every one of them worked out well. It's just, not, you know, you were always learning from every time you, had, you went out there, and, you know, Ken Carmody would be out there bidding for the same thing, yeah. and uh, you'd see colleagues coming in for various collections. But we did buy a lot of things from local people. Uh, as far as uh, mentoring goes, other than, uh, were there anybody other than Reedon and, and Zeitlin who was an uh, influential character for you in, in your book career? Yeah, not really. They, they mean, were the two? I, yeah, they were the two, uh, my father um, and his father, my, my grandfather. grandfather. My yeah. grandfather was uh, a, a professor of English literature at Colby College, and uh, he was known for his work in Thomas Hardy. Mm -hmm. and he wrote a, a, a book that was famous on forage painting history, and um, so we. In your blood, really. So we had books all around the house, and yeah. and my his his father was a, a minister in, in in Boston. He had books around his house, and uh, I mean I came to know Howard Carno and Ken Carmiel and the Heritage Boys and uh, Barney Rosenthal and John, uh, Warren Howell. Um, I, I would go around L.A. and s visit as many bookshops as I could. Uh, for a time, at least, you could go up and down Westwood Boulevard. There'd be a I remember. four or five shops there that were fun. Uh, Carnos was among them. Yeah. Uh, and um, uh, Howard was very friendly. He, would, he, in, he invited my wife and I over to his house to join in his parties at the beach. And, um, and people... Uh, but uh, it was a, it was very different. Uh, yeah. Kurt Schwartz, he was around, but he, we weren't very what friendly. To but Kurt? I really didn't know him very well. Um, yeah. Had had a had a, had his little house in Westwood Village, and I visited there once. Uh, well, it used to be we a thriving book community. And I I went to visit uh, uh, Barry Barney. Oh, sorry, Harry Levinson. Only went to his place once. Right. Uh, it, I mean, it wasn't it just didn't have the kind of things I was looking for. Uh, Frank either. Spellman was was always interesting. Yep. He had nice things, uh, and and he was he had more of the things that Ken and he had things that were more of interest to me, yeah. the scholarly kind of books. And uh -huh. George Houlet had his shop down there too. Uh, George still has a shop down there too. It's, it's well, George, George at that time was in Westwood. But now he's over and on... And now he's on, on uh, Beverly. Beverly, near, uh, near La Cienega? Yeah, well, it's nearer to La Brea, actually. Not nearer to La Brea, okay. Um, what aspects of the book business have changed for you since the Internet Revolution? Oh, well, the, the book business, I think, is totally different from what I was learning in, at Zaitlin's. Uh, and... The internet is certainly the the major factor. Uh, it's it's affected everything. Uh, the most quickly noticeable is the book fairs. I'm, I'm not even sure if the book fairs can really survive, in the way that we would both buy and sell at a book fair. Expect to see more activity, more customers. Um, well, it felt that way. Yeah. I mean, we would always complain that there wasn't enough people around whatever day it was yeah. I could there was we this was actually a time when we un, when in in the southern california chapter of the aba we 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 transferred from doing the shows by the seat of our pants as booksellers to hiring a, a right. management firm to represent the trade right. and and devote their time to 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 making the shows work because it was all too much work I, I mean this was before my time but it was at that very time that this transaction was happening. Mm -hmm. And it made a big difference. I think that when you started to have a committee of booksellers working together to, 
to make a show work and then having a, a management firm carry out what they wanted it was That's far more effective and absolutely and I remember specifically that Barbara Rutenberg was influential in bringing in many more international dealers to yeah. the Southern California shop and then it was at the same time that the Getty was looking to buy and she'd say well you know the Getty's coming in and buying books and the UCLA's coming in and buying books and that would get dealers in here yeah it always will I mean as long as they're buying yeah. but you don't see the Getty here now no, and, and uh, you don't see an awful lot of dealers buying either. Well, it feels that way, but I think they're buying, but they'll buy a selective item here and there. Yeah. They won't buy. I, I would come out of a show with two boxes of books before. Easily. Now I w I'll buy two books. I've bought two books at this show. I'm not ever going to try and buy a, a, a couple of boxes of books at a show like this. You're not going to be Prices able to. are at their height already, and it's reaching. I mean, you. You can't really see room above on some things. Some things, if you have the imagination, you can yeah. uh, take take another thing. I, I looked at several things yesterday. I mean, ten thousand dollars for this book, and I look it up online. There's another copy for thirty five hundred, another their copy, and if it's already being offered for sale, they haven't sold it. They're probably exposed to the clientele that you might be thinking yeah. of, and what can you do? Do you uh, find that? Uh, that you've gotten a lot of new customers from the internet? Well, not really, no. Because I, I, I don't feel like they're the kind of regular customers that we'd call yeah, the backbone well, of our... Yeah, mostly they're not. Yeah, I think, I think that while we do get some who return again and again, they like to use the internet. They, they're really they oriented prefer. towards trying to repeat the pattern of what they had already done. And even if we tell them that they're... It's sort of it's costing us a percentage that we're losing. We're not really dealing on the same circumstance. They're at, they're going through a middle middleman, and they don't realize they're being they're paying the middleman, and so we have to either I've done I've done er this every which way. I'll, I've either kept my prices all the same all across the board, listing them on six different sites, or I've raised them on some sites and kept them the same on my site and the ILAB site, which is the one I want people to use to buy books. Yeah, unfortunately, um, we got most of uh, most of our uh, sales come from Abe. Abe is by far the strongest. Yeah, and and of course our own ILAB site is is one of the weakest. Yeah, because our dealer base is so much smaller. It's never going to change from that. Yep. We have no choice. Yep. Uh, but I feel strongly that that site is very important that we keep because it's ours and, and when you have a bookseller own site that's what we really want we want well to be I able I to, agree. to I use agree. that as our as our tool but Amazon is performing terrifically right now um, Barnes & Noble does not do so well um, I think it's because uh, I go through a Libris a Libris takes a percentage Barnes & Noble is getting another percentage above that we're paid crap for shipping and I we have absolutely have so ridiculous. I have issues with that all across the board. Uh, the idea that that every book weighs two pounds and can be shipped anywhere for yeah. two dollars and sixty five cents, and then no insurance. You don't. No one wants to take care of the merchandise that you want to take care of yourself. That yeah. the kind of care that you would take. International shipping in in flat rate envelopes that don't protect books is something we have to do commonly but yeah. it doesn't protect the book the way we would have always learned to, to wrap properly uh, the trade with ABE is is not a professional trade it's it's a it's a conglomerate or a mishmash of that's what it is of pea soup in a way <laughs> so um, some people I mean it's, it's sort of the eBay thinking of you know anybody can be a dealer and you don't know who you're dealing with on the other end some of them are very professional even yeah. if they're not members of this association that doesn't that mean they're not it you get every every kind of thing happening I I actually ordered an item once from Germany and was horrified I mean you you do this is why you're a dealer because you learn from every single thing you do right I'm horrified when I received what I ordered and it was a total photocopy and it was described as being the original book and photocopy, and I, I wow. wrote to express some displeasure with <laughs> what I was delivered. Uh, and I don't read German, but I would check to see what I was getting, and there was no indication that the item was facsimile right. or something. Uh, but that's the kind of thing that 
you know, if you went to a bookshop 20 years ago and you would see the book, handle it, you, you buy this book, you see another book you like, you might even buy several books. You go on the internet and you, you don't know what, that what you're reading represents what you want or not. And, sure. and so you just have to be a smart buyer and you're going to make mistakes and and whether you're a dealer or a private collector, and I, I, some of my collector friends seem to make very smart buys on, on either eBay or, near, or on online uh, frequently enough because they're, they have target vision for one thing. Yeah. And that's always been the advantage of a private collector, no matter who they or when it's been. Because if you, if you were interested only in history of chemistry, in the 1970s and earlier, you could go to every store and look for just that yeah. and, and do fine. You could build a fine collection. Nowadays, um, those same things seem to be priced so high that you can't make too many decisions to buy those things or your money's gone. Well, look, look a little into your crystal ball. Hmm. And um, what do you perceive as the greatest challenges facing the antiquarian book trade? One right now is the constant change. That yeah. We have so much changing that each year really looks different in terms of of the challenges of meeting the te te technological demands. That's really key. Um, if you can't keep up, then you you make adjustments. I mean, either you close down. I mean, in in Los Angeles, uh, at least compared to Boston. I don't see the same thing happening between those cities in terms of the differences in the trade. We have, in Los Angeles, lost a lot of bookshops. And the reason is that the, that the rents have gone up. Yeah. That's the primary reason. It's not really the internet as much. It's a huge influential factor. But when you have fewer customers coming in daily and you, you pair that with somebody saying, well, your rent's going to be three times higher or whatever, there's a shop in Pasadena. He's paying twelve thousand dollars a month rent, and he's brand he's books. I'm sorry. No, brand brand books. brand books is in Glendale. I'm Glendale. talking about Pasadena. Yeah. Um, that's Book Alley. Oh yeah. And and it's a massively huge floor space, and it's and it's fantastic to think that a secondhand shop could do that. And they're two blocks away from the pa Pasadena City College, and I. I'm sure that he's hopeful that he can turn some student textbook trade into a real business. Yeah. But it, you know, you have to sell a lot of textbooks buying huh. uh, twelve thousand dollars a month rent. I mean, it's hard to imagine. Um, I, I'm so mind-boggling. At Zaitlin's, Jake owned his building, and see, the building sold for around seven hundred fifty thousand dollars when when the shop was over and done in nineteen um, eighty-nine. So they would have been renting it if it were for rent, presumably for around seventy-five hundred dollars a month, even then, yeah. uh, and that would have been a lot for yeah. a, a bookshop to handle. Heritage did it; they were actually probably certainly paying more than that with their location on Melrose. But oh yeah. but um, but that's the kind of thing that has changed in Los Angeles. And so if you didn't own your building, you, as usual, bookshops get pushed out and, and, yeah. and some of them have closed. Uh, some still continue at home. Bill Daly's moved to his home. Mike Thompson's moved from his shop to an office. Yeah. My shop, when I started in 1988, uh, when Jake had died, I, I knew that I would continue my business or I would start my business on my own rather than work for another yeah dealer because by the time I had I had uh, say five years into Zaitlin's I knew that the things that I had as issues with what with their business would have been things that they wouldn't let me do unless I had my own business so why work for someone else you never have any of the same problems it pretty much amounts to you know management style and what you buy and what you do with things and I want to do this and they want you to do that and so on it it um, so in in any event, when I started my business, I could have tried to get a storefront, but I chose instead to work at home because I knew that with science and medicine, these are areas where we don't have a whole lot of clients in one area yeah. coming here to buy that particular thing. It's really an international clientele that we're looking at. So you're going to best handle them by catalog. Yeah. And so I've done that. I've done that since 
I started my business in 78, or I'm sorry, 1988, and the catalogs continue from me, but many of my colleagues have stopped. Mm -hmm. The internet uh, seems to be, to some dealers, enough, they think. Right. But I, I don't see how it can be, because you can, you can never ask somebody to look at your internet site long enough in the sense that if I send something to your mailbox every month, that you're going to look at my catalog. You may put it down, not look at it, but I think from my sales results that they do. We've got about a minute left to go, uh, uh, Jeff. And just uh, if somebody were to come to you and ask you for a piece of advice, a young bookseller, what would be the one most important thing you could say to that bookseller as a piece of advice? Well, the quick answer to that is to work for someone else. Do some apprenticeship first. Yeah, yeah. You want to do that for three to five years. That's the best advice. Learn on someone else's nickel. Nickel, yeah. Um, uh, learn the trade through someone else. But um, uh, it. Uh, the other advice is really not to get into it unless you're really devoted to it. I. Mm. I don't know. I. It's. There's. Most of the people here, they do it because they love the they love working with books. Maybe they love working with some book people and so on. But but there's some inner drive they have to have. And I agree. Some people have have left the business because it's not lucrative enough. And and uh, you know when those rents went up and they couldn't have the kind of shop they envisioned, and they said no, that's enough. Yeah. I I I mentioned that that the technology was changing so fast and I can see how it's threatened many occupations. And it seems inevitable that, that the middleman, uh, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, ABE scenario where we're all having to deal with through them is that it can threaten our business in the sense that they kind of own us all. We have no power in what, what they do for, uh, mm -hmm. on our behalf. And, and uh, you know, can drive some of us out of business. I, I would think. I think I in in the long run, it doesn't look so favorable in that regard. Mm -hmm. But it, if you think there won't be enough books, it seems like there are enough books right now. Um, I think there are new things to collect all the time if, if you have the vision to see it. Um, a huge difference for me from the history of science, history of medicine, from Zaitlin's 1970s experience to now is uh, seeing the emergence of you know, 20th century authors, off prints, people wanting to buy Nobel Prize winners, and mm. journals are part of the things that get sold. And there were things that we knew about. We knew they were important. We didn't have them in stock at that time. Mm. And that, that kind of thing has changed. I think those changes keep us going to some extent. And we can't have shelves and shelves of incunabula anymore. Mm. But, but uh, you know, every Another thing for me is that even though I'm a specialist, if an opportunity comes through the door, I'm going to act on it right. so that I don't stick to my specialty specifically. I have to allow what comes my way to help me continue through what I do. Well, that's great. Thanks very much for the interview, Jeff, and uh, thanks for participating in the project. My pleasure.